I've said a lot about Banjo-Kazooie over the years. I've done two scripted videos where one or more Banjo games was the focal point, I posted my reaction to Banjo and Kazooie coming to Super Smash Bros, and even back when I did Let's Plays, I not only did 100% playthroughs of the two Nintendo 64 games, but I also did Banjo-Kazooie Groan's Revenge for the Game Boy Advance and a highlight compilation of my first time playing Nuts and Bolts. I wasn't sure if an analysis about the Banjo-Kazooie series was necessary though, because I found it hard to find something that hadn't already been said. The wonderful soundtrack, the colourful worlds, the engaging and hilarious characters. Even on a more critical level such as the lack of note retention of the first game has been discussed to death. So what else is there to say? Well, I'm going to dive in and see. Quick heads up, I'm going to be spoiling the entire franchise from start to finish and everywhere in between. With that out of the way, let's begin. I'm Hat Warren Gamer, and this is Banjo-Kazooie A Series Talk Retrospective. I remember my sister first expressing an excitement about some game called Banjo-Kazooie to my parents, so naturally they bought it for me. I think the reason for that was the fact that I played Mario 64 a lot more than she did. Although I do wonder how intentional that was at the time I received the game given what was going on. All I remember was a June Friday night in 1999 at my grandparents' house and my dad and my sister were getting on a bus and travelling down to the snowy mountains to go skiing or something like that. On that same evening I was given Banjo-Kazooie on the N64. Because... I'm not sure. I took it home and started playing it over that following weekend and got nowhere until Sunday night when my dad and my sister arrived home from the mountains. My sister told me that I had to press B to get bottles out of the molehill, not A. I felt like an idiot for not reading the dialogue. I continued playing the game over the next while throughout my childhood, progressing alongside my dad and sister, which was the way we played a lot of our games from back in the day. Though I did eventually get through the game myself, I wasn't that good, so a lot of my first time seeing something was when my dad progressed to it. From Clanker's Cabin to Freeze Easy Peak to Rusty Bucket Bay to Click Clock Wood to First Fun all the way up to the final boss and ending. It was kind of wholesome, I felt like we were doing the adventure together as a family. As the years went on, I would continually replay the game over and over every October school holidays. Then of course, Mumbo turns up in the end cutscene and basically announces the new game, Banjo-Tooie. I was keen to get my hands on this game. I opened it up on Christmas Day 2001 and got right into it. I was still garbage at playing, so I saw most of the things for the first time through my dad's playthrough again. Over the years I would still play it in the October school holidays after finishing Kazooie. And of course we get to the end of Banjo 2 and Gruntilda makes one of the most heartbreaking promises ever made in gaming. Just you wait until Banjo 3. <laughs> when I heard about the GameCube, I figured that the new game would be on it. But it didn't come out, and I wasn't too sure what was going on. Young 10 year old me was never too familiar with the world of business. Something did eventually happen though, the next Banjo game I had heard about was a little Game Boy Advance titled Banjo Kazooie Grind's Revenge. It was odd to me that it wasn't named Banjo 3 like I had expected, but it was a new Banjo game and so I opened it up on my birthday in uh, I think 2004, I'm not too sure. I still enjoyed uncovering what it had to offer though, and it was really cool to experience a Banjo game on my own for the first time. Banjo Pilot flew in next and I remember liking it, but it was largely just because it was Banjo characters. Sadly though, my cartridge went missing and so I haven't played it in years up until making this video. Of course, my sudden realisation that something was up came along with a new Banjo game, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, was announced for the Xbox 360 and not a Nintendo console. I was incredibly puzzled as to why, but I just kind of accepted it. My brother did all the research and told me what had happened and who took which IPs. We did have a 360 back in 2008, but I had no desire to pick up the game, and I didn't until I bought it on the Xbox Live Arcade in 2015. I put it down after a bit and picked it back up when making my Grunty's presentation video in 2016. I beat the game but never 100%ed it like I did with all the others. I don't know if that story is anything special. My growing up experience clearly means that I look at the N64 and GBA games with a lot of nostalgia. Nuts and bolts is... Ugh. But I do see merits and flaws in all these games, and I'm going to explore that among other things Banjo related. Let's start with the largely Mario 64 inspired Banjo Kazooie for the Nintendo 64. Yahoo! 
We've all heard the dream story before. Banjo Kazooie started out as an RPG for the Super Nintendo starring a boy named Edison. Development was later pushed to the Nintendo 64 and became a platformer after the team at Rare played Mario 64. Banjo and Kazooie were given the lead role and the rest is history. Personally, I would prefer to play a platformer than an RPG, so I would never argue with these changes. Regarding the actual game that came out, Banjo's first adventure revolves around Gruntula the Witch kidnapping Banjo's sister 2D to steal her beauty. Childish villainy, but it works for a game about cartoon animals. That's all the story we get, and it's all we need. The opening area of Spiral Mountain is effective at teaching you how to play the game. The yellow paths guide players to Bowl's molehills, and the accompanying areas near each molehill provide some practice ground for each move. Players are even rewarded with a six extra honeycomb piece for proper practice of each move. As you enter the lair, the game is still teaching you the core mechanics such as puzzles, note doors, jigsaw pieces and notes themselves without being too much of a hindrance on you. The lack of note retention when leaving the world is the game's first major negative quality. When I was younger, it went over my head because I just more or less accepted it, but as a teenager, I did start to see it as a burden. Interestingly, I did think that after this was removed in the Xbox Live port, the game seemed... off. But that's probably a purist mindset in my head that refuses to accept change. Much like Spiral Mountain, the level design is genius at guiding you through the whole game. The pathway in Mumbo's Mountain is a subtle guide that takes you up to the Talon Trot, one of the most used moves in the game. It's essentially an alternative way of walking that's faster and can get you up steep slopes, but has less action utility in general. The other two moves have immediate application right by their respective molehills that lead to jiggies. The rest of the jiggies are simple for learning and understanding the mechanics while the notes help you get used to Banjo and Kazooie's movement and physics. Mumbo's Mountain is overall a great first level. The rest of the game's moves have immediate application right by their respective molehills except probably for the running shoes. You can argue though that Rare could get away with that since the wading boots, which would have already been learned, function in a similar way. And on top of that, the idea of running really fast is very simple to grasp. After Mumbo's Mountain, the rest of the levels, for the most part, boast what I would call an open air design. What that means is that levels are mostly one room where you can see everything as well as having something big in the middle. I find it helpful for navigation. In certain 2D games like The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, where exploration is prevalent, the world is laid out to you like a map where you can see everything. Though there's no known way to pull this off in 3D, having an open air level is possibly the closest we've come without sticking a minimap on the screen. It takes merely a look around to know where you are and a lot of things of interest can stand out. While you may not be able to see everything from any one spot on the level, if you're attracted by one object of interest, you can go there and from there you can spot another. Treasure Trove Cove, Freeze Easy Peak, Gobi's Valley, Mad Monster Mansion, Rusty Bucket Bay, and to a lesser extent Click Lock Wood all present this with some smaller sub areas behind loading zones. Click Lock Wood embodies this by being generally the same level design four times, which is itself open air, but the full world at large technically isn't. Bubble Gloop Swamp isn't completely open air due to its shape from a bird's eye perspective, but given how distinct every section is and the fact that everywhere is, in some sense, a dead end, it's difficult to get lost. Clanker's Cavern has three open areas, but they're in a line, one of them is strictly speaking the main area, and some parts are coloured differently to prevent confusion. Overall, the levels are fairly simple to navigate due to their open design and use of standout landmarks to inform you of where you are. Additionally, the notes help guide you along pathways which lead to said landmarks, and being something simple and attractive, they help levels feel less intimidating. Speaking of the collectibles, the main collectible, Jiggies, are effective at testing platforming, exploration, and use of moves. I also enjoy most of the mini-games with a few exceptions like Mr. Vile. What I love about the Jiggies is how well they fit into each level. In all my years playing, I couldn't think of a single Jiggy that felt out of place within its own world. Even if it's just walking a tricky path to get to it, there's no detraction from the surrounding environment. As you progress the game, there are more jiggies that need to be revealed through performing an objective rather than just simply walking up to one and picking it up, and even when there are walk-up jiggies in the late game, the paths towards them are either more complicated or treacherous. Jiggies that require performing an action also bear this description. This represents a steady difficulty curve throughout the game. There have been a few standout jiggies over the years such as Eerie the Eagle and the Plant in Clicklock Woods since they take place over the seasons, and they even make sense in their own world since in each Clicklock Woods season time has elapsed from spring through to winter. 
A lesser preferred jiggy would be the one behind rusty bucket based propellers which entails the slowing down and or stopping of several spinning blades, a timer, precarious platforming and a decent chunk of running around. In spite of this, the jiggy has become synonymous with the game. Twitch streamer and YouTuber Proton John even once described it as the quintessential Banjo-Kazooie experience. If you don't do this one, people will be angry. But this is this is the quintessential you saw what Banjo Kazooie experience. Personally, I think people don't like it because it's associated with the hard platforming and lack of note retention, but I wouldn't call it a bad jiggy mission because it tests pure platforming and fits into its world like what I said earlier. Though Mumbo Jumbo is a standout character in the franchise, I never felt those transformations were too significant and have never really viewed them as synonymous with the series. I wouldn't call them bad, but they feel less than what they could. I think it's fair that they offer less utility than the bear and bird form, but I've always felt that lacking an attack, with one exception, held them back from being used more often than just the one or two jiggies that they can pick up. The overworld is also worth highlighting. Gruntilla's lair is full of secrets everywhere waiting to be discovered, whether required for completion or not, and even if it's not required, what you discover can help. Exploration is made deeper by the jiggies brought in by the witch switches and Mumbo's transformations that you can bring outside of the worlds. The lair also portrays Grunty's character by being full of her narcissistic ego. The statues, her cackle at the start of the music, and her random dialogue portions enforce this, not to mention how these constantly remind you of where you are. The endgame kicks off with Grunty's Furnace Fun quiz show. When I was younger, I was always excited about seeing this. I love the atmosphere. The visuals, the music, Grunty's character shining. I love the question variety, visuals, music, standards, and even the extra mechanic of the Joker squares. The downside is, however, that people tend to not pay attention to this stuff. The Grunty questions require talking to Brent Tilda, since the answers change every time you start a new file, resulting in it being either take your time or take your best guess. Ending quizzes have come back in every mainline Banjo game, making it one of the classic Banjo signatures. I've always found the final boss fun, but it does wish to test your egg ability over and over since three of the five segments require them and one of the remaining two is easier with them. There's flying but minimal platforming and a bottomless pit to mess you up and cause you to restart this fairly long fight. What's so wonderful is everything around you, the sky, the music, grunty. It has an amazing atmosphere and in spite of what I said about it mechanically, it's still satisfying to send the Gingernator pecking grunty off her own roof toppling her down when her ego was at her highest, burying her under a boulder where she lies for two years. By the way, the way Grunty shatters before the Gingernator is reminiscent of 2D shattering before Grunty at the start of the game. Isn't this game so cool for goodness sake? It's got so much atmosphere, so much life, so much vibrancy. Banjo-Kazooie takes what Mario 64 started and largely perfected it and well, you know, there are some flaws, it's still a marvellous experience. The moves, the worlds, the jiggies, they neatly fit with each other, resulting in a well-condensed package wrapped up in its charm and atmosphere. So when Mumbo teased Banjo-Tooie, how did Rare follow up? Those two years Grunty was destined to spend under the boulder have passed and so she is ready to head out. Quite literally on a dark and stormy night, Gruntilda's sisters Mingella and Borbella rock up and free her. She exits as a skeleton and so they head off to go fix her, but not before she trashes Banjo's house and kills bottles. A much darker tone is set and the adventure is underway, but that's not all the story cutscenes. There's seeing Klongo, fighting Klongo, meeting Jiggling, which is zombifying him, meeting Bottles' family, meeting Jiggy Wiggy, and finally getting into the first world, Mayhem Temple, and wow that was long. It can take up to 30 minutes to get to this point, while in the first game you can get to Mumbo's Mountain in half the time. As unfortunate as the intro's length is, I love the game's quality as a sequel. The reuse of Spiral Mountain strongly drives that home since you recognise the layout even though it's in a different state, destroyed by minions. You can walk into the first room in Grunty's lair and see the passage to Mumbo's Mountain is blocked. It gives this feeling that if you could get past it, you would be running around Mumbo's Mountain in seconds. Additionally, if you go back to the first game, there's now this feeling that the Jinjo village, while not accessible, is actually there. 
it filled my childhood imagination with a lot of strong wonder. Adding to the sequel quality on a mechanical level, you start the game with all the moves learned in Banjo-Kazooie with new ones to come. Some build on old ones like more kinds of eggs, egg aiming under various circumstances that build drill, while others are new like more shoes grabbing onto ledges which thanks to Mario 64 always felt like it was missing from the first game, torpedo, first person shooting, splitting up, not to mention every move that builds on those last two. The FPS sections, while odd inside of a platformer, were still fun to do. Aside from the stomach in Pterodactyl Land, going around and shooting anything and everything wasn't really a goal. They were more about exploration which helped tie into a game filled with exploration outside of these sections. I also really loved the idea of splitting up since the game could have executed it poorly but I don't think it does. Both Banjo and Kazooie eventually become very versatile by themselves and are well utilised for all sorts of jiggies. Additionally, travelling as a pair isn't made redundant because there are still a number of moves that can only be done together as well as boss fights and transformations. It also allows for more moves to be learnt without running out of space on the N64 controller. Level design is done somewhat differently compared to the first game. In Kazooie, levels are fairly open but not so much in Tui. In an interview with DK Vine, Grant Kirkhope, though not being on the world and level design team, said that one of Rare's mindsets when designing TUI was that bigger is better. I feel like when it came to TUI, we all thought, make it twice the size, it's twice as good. And that wasn't really the case. It just became a bit of a bigger thing, not necessarily twice as good. There are obvious regrets with that philosophy, such as how larger levels run the risk of you getting lost and being overwhelmed. However, given this goal, I think that Rare took quite a clever approach to the designs of the levels to help you not feel those two negative qualities during exploration. Rare's attempt was to cut off portions of the level from your access when first entering them. Somewhat similar to the world expansion mechanic in Ukulele but done a lot more naturally, and it helps that the first level, Mayhem Temple, eases you into it. The pathway from the start leads you through the level passing some of the biggest points of interest and stopping at Target Zan's Temple. The game introduces warp pads for quicker travel as well as makes an example out of the one outside of Mumbo's and the one at the start of the level to show you how they work. Speaking of Mumbo, you're right by him who unlocks access to most of the rest of the level through Golden Goliath. What this does is familiarise you with the first area before bringing new parts into play. Additionally, you're forced to meet with Mumbo before meeting the new shaman, Humba Wumba. Most of the rest of the levels have fairly minor barriers like the build drill boulders in Glitter Gulch Mine or the Inferno and Witchy World, however there are still large ones like oxygenating the water in Jolly Rogers Lagoon. My favourite attempt at this design overall is Grunty Industries. It forces you to enter the building by taking the train and opening up the place from the inside. Access further into the level takes place one step at a time. You visit each new floor one at a time and they have distinct colours and rooms so they don't blend together too much. The warp pads also helped as finding each one felt like the floor had been fully unlocked. For those reasons, I actually found navigating the level to be largely straightforward despite the level's reputation for being a convoluted maze. In a number of other levels, I've heard other people complain about getting lost in them, but that's a problem that I've never personally experienced. There are all sorts of elements that keep you from getting lost in levels. Glitter Gulch Mine has the minecart track and river to act as lines through the level, though I think it's fair to say that those are the least effective in the whole game. Witchy Well is very straightforward with its themed areas. Jolly Rogers Lagoon, while potentially difficult to grasp, isn't that complicated since the underwater areas form a loop. Atlantis to the Big Fish, Big Fish to the Lockers, Lockers to the Sunken Ship, and back to Atlantis. The town centre is also a nice introduction to the level and having Mumbo do magic to make the water breathable helps ease you into what it is that you're doing as stated earlier. Pterodactyl Land is a literal circle though it could use more decorations like some jungle and more spread out warp pads. Hellfire Pix's fire side has simple pathways so you're not too overwhelmed while the area opens up more on the ice side since the snow doesn't damage Banjo and Kazooie like the lava does. Cloud Kaku Land is somewhat obscure but everywhere is distinct and the flower launchers help guide you in a direction when you're not too sure and feel overwhelmed with options. A lot of the kinds of Jiggy missions were largely the same as the first game, but there are still some different ones. There are Jiggies across multiple worlds, there's now a boss in every level that fits the theming, each rewarding a Jiggy. I would even argue that Minji Jongo fits Cloud Kakuland given that Cloud Kakuland is literally high. 
Anyway, in the first game there was one Jiggy being Bobby's second race that required a move from the later world, but in Tui there's at least one of those in every world except Hellfire Peaks and Karkaku Land. It doesn't bother me too much personally because Banjo Tui does a good job at making its world feel like one full package through its passages between all locations rather than the first game with its start pads, and if you want more details, go watch my video on how Banjo Tui is a Metroidvania. It's okay, I'll wait. Done? Okay, back to this. The only slight downside with this is that the Jiggies can be a little vague. There can be no way to fully tell if you can access them or not without already knowing what to do. I like them when they offer hints that there's something more to this mission like the presence of springy step shoes near the waterfall in Glitter Gulch Mine, and overall there are more hints than without. The only one that I find super vague is the one at the top of the pillar in Jolly Rogers Lagoon which requires the glide from Hellfire Peaks. The only other problematic jiggies overall are the Dipper's Pool and the Pig's Pool which both require actions in other worlds to complete. It's fairly random how you finish them, although it was always amusing to me when I was young how they were done. Shaman Assistance returns with Mumbo doing magic out in the field while the game introduces Humble Wumba to take on Mumbo's role from the first game. All transformations are a little more versatile since they either have an attack are invincible, or are the baby T-Rex that does close to nothing. Two particular standouts to me are the submarine from Jolly Rogers Lagoon and the washing machine from Grunty Industries. The washing machine, while being slow and heavy, uses the fact that it's mechanical to get around the level in a different way. The submarine has clever ways of working through the lagoon with the weakness of land travel, but one of my favourite parts is that you can fight the level's boss as the submarine, and I always do since the torpedoes are unlimited and you don't have to restock your grenade eggs all the time. Mumbo can be a little frustrating to use though. I think the idea is that he's weaker and so you take on the challenge to traverse the level as him, but it doesn't work as well since it's not that hard to avoid enemies and use warp pads. The Island of Hags may not be as impressive as Grunty's Lair, but still has the mark left by the witches and the digger tracks that you follow through the whole game up until Cauldron Keep. I love that it's consistent in theming where everywhere is somewhat dilapidated, while still managing to match the themes of whatever world you happen to be near. However, if there's one thing about the Island of Hags that deflates me, it's the Jiggies for it. It has 10 in the total screen. One is the one Jiggling gives you at the start, which I think is fair, but the other nine are completing the nine Jinjo families, which makes the world feel like it doesn't have much to offer. I appreciate everything that's in it, like Heggy, Honeybee, the Jinjos you collect, moves, and even a train station, but it still felt like something was missing. Adding to that feeling would be how much smaller it is as some later level entrances feel tacked onto an area just so it can be there. On the other hand, I love the way progression is done. Advancing through the lair in Kazooie required notes to open note doors, but in Tui, notes are only superficially different, but still technically let you proceed through the Island of Hags. They now come in notes nests as a group of five and no longer reset with Death of the Departure, which is a nice little change, but they're also now used to learn moves, which help you advance through the hub. Meaning that even though the passage from the Wooded Hollow to the Plateau is open from the start, you need the grip grab to get to it, which requires 35 notes. So the passage is a glorified 35 note door, but what I love is that the use of the moves helps the world feel a little more natural. Moving on, Cauldron Keep serves as the final act containing another quiz game similar to the first game, but with a different structure. No squares and two opponents. Grunty questions are gone, but the audio questions are too, and the visual questions don't let you know the question as you see the image, and if you're buzzing early, you won't see the question at all. I don't mind that challenge too much, but it irks me when Mingella or Blabelda buzz in, don't see the question, and answer correctly. The third round is the best one, since there are no opponents to be annoying pests. What I like about the final battle is that it actually tests platforming, but actually attacking Grunty is done in the FPS mode, which I think is fair that part of it is done in the FPS mode, but not the whole thing. One cool idea might have been having to climb the Hag 1 and peck her. I will always appreciate Banjo Tui for everything it tried. I can't say I prefer it over Kazooie, but whether it was successful or not, Tui was ambitious. I love the idea of expanding the worlds from the inside of them by using the moves and solving the game's own riddles. The game ends with the infamous promise of a new game called Banjo 3E. <laughs> but what actually happened? Well, a new Game Boy Advance game came along called Banjo Kazooie Grunty's Revenge. Granny's Revenge starts out as a sequel to Kazooie, but a prequel to Tui. This kind of narrative placement is bound to produce potholes, and it does, but this is a kid's video game about cartoon animals, so I really don't care. 
Granny kidnaps Kazooie and goes back in time to prevent Banjo and Kazooie from meeting. It's something new and it exists to get the game going. The time travel element isn't used much else, but it never bothered me personally after the game had gotten started. Design-wise, Revenge hits this rather interesting middle ground between Kazooie and Tui in various aspects. The world returns to smaller yet more open level designs similar to Kazooie, but the game uses a lot of Tui's set pieces like Jiggy Wiggy's Temple and Honey Bee's Hive, and even takes on a number of changes made in Tui like not resetting notes in Jinjo's when dying or leaving the world, and requiring notes to learn moves. The levels themselves are much smaller here than either of the N64 games, but that's actually hidden well through the Game Boy Advance's screen size, making them feel physically bigger than what they are. The screen size itself can also help make the levels feel less daunting as you won't feel overwhelmed with too many options by simply seeing them right away. Notes are still used for guiding you along the path to a slightly lesser extent than Kazooie, but I don't think there's harm since the levels aren't that small. The Jiggy missions aren't too terribly different compared to Kazooie's. They all fit into their worlds and they have fairly steady difficulty curves. Despite the steadiness of the curve though, nothing gets too terribly hard by the end. Out of five worlds, the difficulty by the fifth world is about as difficult as the fifth worlds in the N64 games, meaning that it gets to about medium. I personally do enjoy the minigames, although I remember having a rough time with the fishing game when I was younger, largely just because I didn't read the instructions and didn't grasp that you could hold down the button for less time to fish from one of the higher rows. I do like how they escalate in difficulty though. The first game is get as many as you can, the second game is get only the one of the two types, and the third game is the same as the second, but you can't see them before fishing them out, so you have to carefully assess their movement patterns to be successful. And yes, they are different. There is the slide as well. It doesn't evolve as strongly as the fishing, but still enjoyable. Sadly though, I'm not too fond of the overhead vehicle games due to their tricky controls. The boss fights are fairly basic, but they're fine. Attacks are communicated well and things change up as you progress even if it's one of the same two enemies every time. However, above all of them is the fight in Spiller's Harbour. Grunty's attack affects the way you aim, which forces you to be strategic in how you shoot her. It's a little tricky, but I think it works quite well. Transformations have a significant overhaul in this game. This time you can choose any transformation to become in any level. This creates all sorts of different challenges for you to overcome as well as challenge the way you think about a level. It helps too that every transformation is used in at least two levels and they have all sorts of varying mechanics. The mouse is small but has no attack, the tank is heavy and packs quite a punch but can't jump, the candle can be a light in darkness and the squid can swim in dangerous liquids. In all the games, I think this is the transformation mechanic at its peak Spiral Mountain takes on the role as the hub in this game. I like that the area itself acts as its own world with 10 Jiggies, 100 Notes, 5 Jinjos, etc. and that you can access more of it as you learn moves throughout the game. The contents itself is fairly simple for the most part and the difficulty lands somewhere between Cliff Farm and Brigal Beach on average. One other enjoyable element is that the overall layout of the hub is similar to the layout of Spiral Mountain in the N64 games. The mountain itself is in the centre with Grunty's lair to the right, the cliff farm area is where the vegetable patch is, the entrance to Bad Magic Bayou is where the stumps are, and the water up the top is the upper water area. Obviously it's not one to one, but how often are repeated video game areas like that? Like how often is Hyrule identical in each Zelda game? Grunty's Lair becomes the final act for the game with a fight against Grunty, another against Klungo, and another against Grunty to be the final boss on the top of the tower, as well as quiz games between each of them. The earlier fights are sadly just rehashes of older fights with not much new to them. I think it would have been awesome to have another fight similar to the one against Grunty in Spillers Harbor. I did enjoy the quizzes though since they contained more variety in questions like Kazooie without the death and Grunty squares, as well as the removal of opponents from Tui. Between Kazooie and Tui's respective quiz games, it's the best of both worlds. The final bosses are set up from the earlier bosses in the lair. A lot of phases have some new ideas while still testing you on the game mechanics. Overall, Grunty's Revenge is nothing more than a simple banjo game on a handheld. Its greatest strength is capitalising on the best of both N64 games. The only problem is that it's not as inspired as them. It doesn't really try to do anything new. Once Grunty's defeated, she requests Congo to summon her sisters leading into Tui, and Banjo says to summon others to hopefully finish a card game this time. Wait, hold on, I thought this was before Tui. I, I don't even know, M maybe this group just has a gambling problem or something. One other element I haven't mentioned mainly regarding Revenge and Tui is how ambitious Rare can be when developing for various hardware. Despite the low world count in Revenge, Rare did manage to pack so much into such small locales. Space for transformations, 10 Gs, 100 notes, and still use the game screen to make the game feel bigger. 
On a more impressive level, Banjo-Tooie is a game that pushes the Nintendo 64 hardware incredibly far. The world sizes, the graphics, particularly Banjo and Kazooie themselves. It's no wonder the game lags a lot. I think the reason Tooie's feat was more impressive than Revenger's is because Rare had spent more time with the Nintendo 64 hardware and so they had a better understanding of it by the end of its life cycle. But it is worth noting what Rare pulled off with Revenge through stuff like its minigames and the Spillers Harbor boss fight. Admittedly not as impressive as something like Superstar Saga, but then again, this was their first game on the Game Boy Advance. Over respective console generations, Rare figured out how to push Nintendo's hardware and make what appears impossible work, impressing Nintendo by breaking into the NES, coming up with pre-rendered graphics, then developing the Donkey Kong Country games on the Super Nintendo, a number of late Nintendo 64 games, and even Saber Wolf on the Game Boy Advance, which took advantage of Rare's pre-rendered graphics like the DKC remakes. I don't think the GBA feats were as impressive as the console feats, but that could be due to the Microsoft buyout circumstances of the early 2000s. But this does make me wonder what Rare might have been able to pull off with the GameCube Wii or Wii U had they stayed with Nintendo. So we've had three adventure games, but now we have a small racing game. Banjo Pilot started out as Diddy Kong Pilot but became a Banjo game because of the Microsoft buyout. It's a simple spin-off racing game just like Mario Kart. I don't have a lot to say about it, it's decently fun, has a fair few things to offer, but I find it hard to look past the fact that it started out as something else. Outside of the backgrounds, the courses have little to nothing to do with the franchise, not to mention that during the transition from Diddy Kong to Banjo, someone forgot to remove Expresso's cameo. It has a fair few modes to keep up the single player content, but nothing I personally found too terribly memorable. It's an average race with a few things to do in it, not much else. Moving on, at long last, a brand new mainline Banjo game that's a sequel to Tui was coming, but it was on an Xbox console. I picked up that something had happened regarding where Banjo games land, but I was just so happy to see the promise of something that I had been waiting for for about six years now. The graphics looked a little odd, but I did recognize who they were, so I wasn't too upset. In 2008, Rare released Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts for the Xbox 360. Nuts and bolts. What? Why? Why is it called that? A, a car game? Uh, okay. Is a uh, is there collecting like the previous games? Well, I I see notes, but they're currency. Hmm. And the jiggies are won by doing car missions rather than exploration and platforming. Um. <laughs> okay. Maybe maybe it'll be good. Once upon a time, there lived a heroic bear called Banjo, a rather loud bird called Kazooie, and an unpleasant witch called Gruntilda. Well, the game starts out reminding you of the two previous games and shows Grunty's disembodied skull back in Spiral Mountain feeling ready as ever to take on Banjo. They almost start fighting until the Lord of Games shows up and mediates their battle and by extension the entire game. Log pits Banjo and Kazooie against Grunty in various activities to win back Sparrow Mountain. I do find Log's role in the game to be rather pointless. I sometimes feel like he's the bad guy that I need to overcome because he's the one holding Sparrow Mountain ransom while Grunty's just kind of there. And if you want to hear more about this topic then check out my video on Grunty's role in the Banjo series, but I'm warning you, it's pretty cringe. One of Nuts and Bolts' biggest criticisms is that it's a good game but a bad Banjo game. The intent being that people can accept it as an enjoyable experience, but it doesn't fit in well with the rest of the Banjo games. Not necessarily trying to call out anyone in particular, but that basis just sounds like an excuse to criticise something for not being what you wanted it to be. To be fair, you can't really call it a spin-off in the same way Mario Kart or Banjo Pilot a spin-off since they were designed to be spin-offs, while Nuts and Bolts was intended to be a true sequel to Banjo Tooie. However, I would like to give the game a fair go. So at the end of the day, I'm just going to talk about Nuts and Bolts by its own merits. Okay, let's get into some of the game's mechanics. You're introduced to Mumbo's garage for building your vehicles. The tutorial covers the basics of building and has a skip button if you need it. Following this, you're in the first level by these complicated means. Now the levels in this game are... complicated. In regards to set pieces, nothing really seems out of place and there are interesting worlds to explore... mostly? Look, there's nothing to explore in the Jigger Sim. You see it once, you see it all. 
Logbox 720 can be fairly discouraging since it's really cluttered and too many things look the same. A similar statement could be made about the Terrarium of Terra, but that level is bigger and everything is a little more spread out and distinct. The first time I visited Nutty Acres, I wanted to explore it. It looked like it had something to offer. I followed the path with all the notes and I was enjoying myself. While exploring the worlds in the hub, you can find notes which are used as currency for more vehicle parts. It, rather ironically, added a bit of a collectathon element to the game, keeping some of the old elements of the three previous Banjo games. The Jiggy missions are triggered by talking to NPCs. They all contain some kind of vehicle based objective, and aside from ones where the game chooses for you, you have to come up with a vehicle that you think is best suited for the mission. Missions can range from land, water, air, speed, weight, cargo holding, and everything in between. There's quite a selection of stuff to use for vehicles and you're the one who builds it all. It was essentially the hybrid between Legos and Minecraft. Over the course of the game I did notice a vibe I was getting. It was reminding me of The Simpsons Hit and Run, which of course is a game very similar to Grand Theft Auto. I've not played much GTA personally, but I have played a lot of Hit and Run and really enjoyed it, and I can see a similar enjoyment in Nuts and Bolts. Although I did sometimes get a little overwhelmed thinking about all the vehicle possibilities and feeling completely absent from ideas right from the beginning. I appreciate the forced vehicle missions since they can inspire you and the requirement to complete the missions can also do that. For example, I was really slow in this boat race in Banjoland, so I added some things to it and on the second attempt I was much faster. Even as you progress through the game, you can unlock parts and it's helpful in not having too many options right out of the gate and more stuff later on can give you ideas. The downside however is revealed in the forced missions. They can be very challenging gameplay wise because the vehicles will have their own limits built into them, but that's a good thing. The problem comes in when you choose your own vehicle. You can create a powerhouse that can do one thing immensely well. This detracts from the gameplay and makes any two missions of similar type feel sloppy and samey. Need a race? Pick the fast one. Transport an object? The cargo hold. Need to shoot something? The vehicle with the grenade launches. It turns the 100 plus Jiggy missions into a monotony and makes them feel unnecessary. The Hub World Showdown Town is designed around granting you more car parts for more expansive travel which gives you access to future worlds. Opening future worlds isn't any less obnoxious than 90 acres and in some cases more obnoxious. The Jigaseum I thought might have been a cool puzzle, but I solved it by accident and even at first, I thought I stuffed it up by having the game world get attached to the magnet. At least I technically did it right. The final world and act is Spiral Mountain where you face off against Grunty. The quiz element comes into play here to get a higher score in the missions. I must say, I kind of like the two Spiral Mountain missions. They're both full of various tasks that require all sorts of different abilities. I think it's cool and reflective of the game to force you to flex your creative muscles and come up with something that can fulfill everything required in the one mission. The only real problem is that Spiral Mountain's design was made to be a training ground and not a final boss arena. Some of this is remedied by being in the air as well as some parts altered to accommodate vehicles more, including upscaling the physical size compared to Banjo and Kazooie, but it's still fairly cluttered. I think it would be better if there was a new area made to be a final boss arena. It wouldn't have to be completely open air as in it doesn't have to be easy to get around, just something that's a little more designed to be a final boss arena. Nuts and Bolts is a consistent package. It starts off with something and runs with it right to the end, but due to the similarity of the missions the whole way through, it feels long. It would be decently good if half the jiggies or more were cut. This would allow the idea of building vehicles to not run dry as easily. All these ups and downs leave the game feeling... okay. And that's Nuts and Bolts, but earlier I said I would judge the game by its own merits. Now I'm going to criticize it as a Banjo game. First off, I can't overstate how much Banjo charm is in this game. Fourth wall breaks, humor, and references to previous games, even going so far as to show an actual Nintendo 64 in the opening sequence. My worry though, is that it might just be too much. As if the devs tried too hard to make references so that veteran Banjo players would remember that this series used to be cool and it's clear that they did that by the existence of the level Banjo Land. When I first heard about this level, I was really excited and thought all the references were really great, but at the same time, I saw the pandering below the surface. Even in the character appearances, this is overboard. 
Banjo-Tooie had a fair few cameos from the first game like Cheeto, Captain Blubber, Tip Top, Conga, Gobi, Logger, Boggy, the Zubas, who all, to the exception of Gobi, appear once, and Mumbo Jumbo, who appears in all worlds. They kept them few and far between just to be fun nods to the original. However, Tui introduced a wealth of new characters. Humba Wumba, Bloatazan, Bullion Bill, Big Al, Salty Joe, Jolly Roger, Porno, Crispy Bacon, Dippy, Mr. Fit, all the bosses just to name a few. Nuts and Bolts creates Log, Trophy Thomas, and Pikelet. Everyone else is someone from an earlier game and they're reused over and over. Not to mention how often the quiz game asks you about the first two games, nothing quite like being tested on something the game can't teach you. Admittedly Banjo-Tooie did this once or twice, but it's not to the extreme that Nuts and Bolts does. Sadly, all this does is increase the pandering level. The set pieces of the first two games aren't why they're great. That's like saying Mario's great because his hat is red. So cluttering Nuts and Bolts with all that memorabilia won't make Nuts and Bolts great. Banjo and Kazooie's moles are both blocky, Banjo more so. The Rare Revealed video on Nuts and Bolts development shows that they believe the design was best suited for the game, and I actually agree with that. Banjo's blocky aesthetic aligned more with the blocky environment of the car builder in much the same way the model of Steve from Minecraft is pure blocks with no curves. Banjo and Kazooie obviously do have curves in Nuts and Bolts, but so do car parts. They just live in the blocky environment. Do I think the models look good in general? Eh, they're okay. Kazooie looks pretty snarky, which goes with her character, and Banjo does look a little dim-witted, but I still prefer the smoother models of Smash and the platformers. Speaking of the platformers, there is of course the element that the internet will never be silent on, the gameplay and genre. Banjo and Kazooie are recognized for being platforming characters since the first three out of their four mainline games have them platforming, while three out of their four spin-off games show them driving. The game even denounces the things of the previous games near the beginning before even starting the main adventure. Nuts and Bolts throws away what made Banjo-Kazooie great and replaces it. But why? Well, we need to go back to 2002. We all know this story. Rare was bought by Microsoft and numerous Rare games were reworked or cancelled. Donkey Kong Racing, the promised sequel to Diddy Kong Racing, was gone. Diddy Kong Pilot became Banjo Pilot as discussed earlier. A few more projects came to be, such as Grabbed by the Ghoulies and the mysterious Banjo 3 was forgotten. I say forgotten because based on the Rare Revealed video, it seems the project was dropped entirely or at least put on the back burner until the mid 2000s and then reworked from the ground up. They said that it started out as like a remake-ish of the first game, but really a sequel that reused all the old levels from the first game. I personally think it would have been amazing, but I say that as a Banjo fan. The problem they thought of was how to communicate to people that it was, for the most part, a new game since it was using all the same old levels. It would have been a Wii vs Wii U situation where the latter product looked too much like an earlier one and so people not realising it's something new. The ideas had developed from something where Grunty appears on each level and actively interacts with Banjo until they decided to add the car gameplay to the game. I can't help but wish that, much like the original Dream, Rare changed their protagonists like the way many feel. Because now it's an okay car building game with a coat of Banjo-Kazooie cameos on top. The abruptly changed gameplay coupled with the pandering cameos feels like this is a misrepresentation of Banjo. A Banjo game by appearance, and that's all. Due to the misrepresentation of the franchise and the alright gameplay overall, I wouldn't call Nuts and Bolts a good game but a bad Banjo game. I would call it an average game and a mishandled Banjo game. Now before you get all aggro over me calling out people for creating excuses to criticise Nuts and Bolts because it's different while I still did it myself, I criticised it as a Banjo game because of how it abuses the franchise to try and make the game more likeable. The problem isn't that the gameplay changed necessarily, it's that the game mishandles the franchise to try and justify the change. If this was a spin-off that came out maybe one year after a mainline platformer, it would have been fine. Nuts and Bolts ends with Log dismissing the idea that Banjo and Kazooie were coming back, while Grunty teases the idea that another game was coming. Either way, someone was going to be right. <laughs> So who was right? What happened next? 
They appeared in the Xbox version of Sega and Sonic All-Stars Racing, the three big mainline games were re-released on Rare Replay for the Xbox One, and of course the biggest groundbreaking event was that Banjo and Kazooie came as a DLC fighter in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Banjo and Kazooie coming to Smash felt like a return. Not only were Banjo and Kazooie back, but they were jumping and not driving. They were smooth and not blocky. They were on Nintendo and not Xbox. Just the way I like them. The moveset was fully drawn from the first two games, and aside from their uptaunt, there was nothing from Nuts and Bolts. And excluding the look of Banjo's house, same applies to the music and stage. I wouldn't have minded if there was a music track from Nuts and Bolts, but I'm not too fussed. Their appearance in Smash is as faithful as the appearance of any character from any franchise because of stuff like moves, music, a stage, among other things. But what makes it special is the length of time it's been since their last appearance. Even longer since their last appearance in something new, even longer since their last appearance in a mainline entry, even longer since their last appearance on a Nintendo console, and even longer since their last appearance in a mainline entry game on a Nintendo console, and even longer since their last highly recognized appearance on a Nintendo console. Additionally, even the Banjo fans who aren't into Smash were excited because this event brought them back into the light. They were made relevant again. Although it's hard to say how long that would have lasted due to Sakurai's immeasurable enthusiasm for including Terry next up, but I digress. Personally, I wasn't too sure what we may have gotten for new content, but one thing I was really sure about was that Microsoft might be inclined to allow ports of the Xbox versions of both Banjo-Kazooie and Tui to the Switch. So, if you want to play Banjo-Kazooie today, you can do so on Xbox. <laughs> well, that didn't happen. The future of the series is a bit mysterious at this stage. In February of 2019, Solo and Cola did an interview with Chris Marlowe from Rare. Marlowe was mainly involved with Conker, but he does comment on the prospects of a new Banjo game alongside the possibility of a new Conker game. A new Conker, or there's also a rumor about a um, Banjo remake? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really, no. <laughs> no. I mean, mm. new Conkers, new Banjos. We've discussed this a lot over the weekend. And <laughs> I'm not sure we could ever make anything that anyone would be totally happy with, because yeah. it's like, maybe we could, it's... It's worth mentioning that this should be taken with a grain of salt, since his main focus is Conker, as stated above, but he does have a point. It's been a long time since Banjo-Tooie. In the time since, Rare hasn't made much in the way of 3D platformers aside from Conker's Bad Fur Day itself, while their main focus today is supporting and updating Sea of Thieves, and a lot of development staff have left and gone elsewhere. The only thing I can realistically see causing Rare to change their minds on this would be the immeasurable amount of praise given to Nintendo, Sakurai, Rare, and Microsoft after Banjo and Kazooie's inclusion in Smash. Grant Kirkhope even thinks that, but he's also well aware of the reality as expressed in his interview with Nintendo Life shortly after the Smash announcement. Important reminder that Kirkhope doesn't work for Rare, so his word is only speculation and shouldn't be treated as definitive. I'm of the opinion that if there's going to be more Banjo content, it should actually be handed over to a different studio. I'd be more than keen on seeing Retro Studios make an attempt at this, but they can only do so much. They would at least make a well-designed video game, but being an American studio, they may not be able to capture Banjo's british fueled charm. You can see this in the differences between the Donkey Kong Country trilogy on the Super Nintendo and Returns and Tropical Freeze, but I don't know what's going to happen. The best idea that I could come up with that might be slightly realistic is seeing a rare replay for the Switch that includes things like the Donkey Kong games and Star Fox Adventures, but might have to drop games that came out on an Xbox console like Grab by the Ghoulies or Viva Pinata. Outside of that, and after thinking about it, I might be okay if this is it. I've been looking back at a full list of childhood memories from my personal story about the series, what I love about the Nintendo 64 games and Granny's Revenge, how little I have to say about Banjo Pilot after going several years without playing it because I lost my original copy, the negative things I have to say about Nuts and Bolts and how I feel about Banjo and Kazooie's appearance in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. These all reflect that of someone who grew up with the Nintendo 64 and played the Banjo games on them. A lot of what I've said is partially due to how I felt as a child. Like how I said that Grunty's fight in the first game tested mostly egg usage and there wasn't much pure platforming, but I loved the atmosphere. My comments on Dippy's pool and the pig's pool jiggies in Tui seemed to show a mechanical weakness, but I still loved the comedy behind them. I didn't say much about Banjo Pilot because I didn't spend a lot of time playing it. I still criticize Nuts and Bolts as a Banjo game and how much of a slap in the face it is to the legacy that preceded it. Why else did I describe the way Banjo was presented in Smash as just the way I like them? It's because it's the way I like them!
the way I want them to be, the way I remember them. A nostalgic way. This is a nostalgic memory. After nuts and bolts, they faded into obscurity and were only removed from that obscurity in Smash. Way more than Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing or even Rare Replay itself could ever do. I will always love Banjo-Kazooie, but I know that another blunder might send them packing and fading into obscurity more than what they already are. They're only less obscure now because of Smash and I don't know how long that's gonna last. You could even argue it was over when Terry or the Stan's Me costume were announced. I know there are a number of game series that have come back after a long hiatus and even the Banjo cast through their fourth wall breaking tendencies suggested that something should happen but nothing really has. The 20th anniversary of the series came and went. We might still be living in Banjo Smash Brothers era but soon all we may find is a decapitated Kazooie in front of Rare's office. Now don't get me wrong. If suddenly a new Banjo game was announced, I will be excited. I'll be interested in what's going on and who made or is making it. But I'm content with what we have. And don't think that I don't have any faith that Rare can do it. It just seems less and less likely that they want to, and if they don't want to, it's not going to be very good. I see no reason to whinge and complain about what we don't have, but instead rejoice in what we do have. Let me play a little more from that interview with Chris Marlowe from Rare. I mean, you've got games like doing things like Hat in Time, which yeah. I hear wonderful things yeah, it's, about. Yeah, uh, it's great. And you, you yeah. could say, that's just your new generation's banjo. Enjoy that for what it is. Yeah. There are plenty of good similar games out there. A Hat in Time, New Super Lucky's Tale, older games getting remakes, not to mention that 3D Mario is still going. Have you tried this little indie game? Poi. It just doesn't feel like there is because of Ukulele's lukewarm reception, but I don't think that's the end of it. Impossible Lair has done a lot better than the first game, and it's my hope that the positive reception encourages Platonic to give 3D platforming another go. I think they just need to go back and look more at the original Banjo-Kazooie, or even Mario 64, rather than thinking about building on Tui, which is clearly what was attempted. Or even if they still build on Tui, maybe a different part of it. You know, like how it's a Metroidvania and whatnot, you know? Wink wink nudge nudge. Banjo-Kazooie is a beautiful franchise that was hit by several unfortunate events, but it does stand as an inspiration to many new developers who wish to produce their own follow-ups. The death of Banjo-Kazooie, assuming there is a death, doesn't mean the death of 3D platforming, and what they've left behind is beautiful and inspiring. As stated earlier, I'd like to rejoice in what we have, rather than whinge about what we don't have. I'm Hat Wearing Gamer, and this has been Banjo-Kazooie, a series talk retrospective. Hey, hi, hello, how you doing? How is everyone going? Thank you so much for sitting through 50 minutes of me talking about Banjo-Kazooie. Don't know why you would do that, but you did it. Well done. Um, yeah, I know it's been a bit of a while since I've uh, uploaded a video last September. Um, but you know, I think with, you know, certain uh, final level of Mario Sunshine floating around, you'd expect delays and well, although that only really excuses like the second half of this long break between uploads. Um, the first half, well, I mean, I was kind of working on another video and then I just changed. So, that's a thing. Um, but yeah, so I'm doing okay, if everyone's wondering. I hope I'm still doing okay by the time this video uploads, which will be in a few days from when I'm recording this. Um, so yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say, there's various credits to give out, but I can't remember everyone's names off the top of my head, and I don't have them written down because I'm an idiot, so they're all on the screen, so, um, be sure to, uh, memorize the names, go check out the links, um, yeah, just, if you want to look at them, if you want to see more information about any kind of reference that I made, um, yeah, go check that out. Um, uh, ne up next, I'm going to be doing Paper Mario, um, which, well, yeah, like the new Paper Mario series talk uh, analysis series of the whole thing from uh, the original all the way up to, well, I guess Origami King, since, uh, like, I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah, uh, the, the, that, that game's going to come out before the, paper, the first Paper Mario video uh, is completed. So. I guess we'll look forward to that when it comes. Um, I'm pretty keen to sink my teeth into it as well. It's pretty good. I don't want to play the Paper Mario games again. Especially like Thousand Year Door and Super. 
it should, should be a good time. Um, I've also got a couple of other things up my sleeve as well, um, because there are other videos that, um, like I said, like in my update video from back in like the start of the year when I, when I had some video ideas, like I still have those ideas and I'm still gonna make them, I'm still hoping to make them uh, a, a time when ever. <laughs> Um, so, but yeah, like, until then, I'd like to thank you all so very much for watching, and I'll see you soon.